So by now, I guess everybody is settled into the rhythm of the place and the way that the day is likely to unfold. So we're not going to start with any <coughs> more information, but if you have any practical <coughs> questions, um, you can maybe talk to River <coughs> later on. Um, we're going to try and end the day today a little bit earlier at about 4.30, just to give you a chance to talk. And uh, sometimes even on a three-day retreat, you might feel you've not... Um, really been very deeply inside or in silence, but you may find that when you do start to surface, there's more stillness than you realise, and it's still good to have a little bit of, uh, of time to just talk to each other and maybe reflect on you know, how the last few days has been for you before going back into the world where we go into our more kind of conditioned ways of relating to others, maybe with people who don't meditate and who haven't been in this retreat. So, um, so that will be an opportunity at the end. And I guess there'll also be some uh, tidying and stuff like that. But there's still a long time before we get to that. And uh, today I'm quite excited because it's one of my favourite subjects about loving kindness. And uh, this is the third of the right intentions. It's actually the second, officially, in the list of right intentions. But... Um, uh, in the Eightfold Path, the Buddha uses the word avyapada, which literally means non-ill will. So this is a synonym, basically, for metta. And ill will is considered to be the far enemy of metta, so the kind of polar opposite, if you like, of what we define as loving kindness. Yeah? So metta in Pali comes from the word metri, which means friendship or friendliness. But it's a little bit more than that. It's actually a sense of uh, loving kindness, loving friendliness, benevolence. You might call it altruistic love or protective love. Um, the Brahma Viharas, the divine abidings that the Buddha talked about, and loving kindness is one of those, were known as the four protections. And um, the Buddha says that even as a mother protects with her life, her child, her only child, so one should abide with a heart of loving kindness towards all beings. Yeah? So sometimes this example of a mother's love is taken to symbolize or um, explain what loving kindness means. You know, this sense of wanting to protect the child from harm and wanting the very best for the child. But the difference here is that this is to all beings as a mother would feel towards the child. So even if you are a mother and, and have this sense of real unconditional love. I've spoken to some uh, mothers, including my best friend, who recently had a child. Um, and they say that, you know, when a child's born, there's just this incredible sense of love that's almost completely natural and spontaneous. I mean, I don't know, because I haven't had a child in this life. I've probably had enough in my past lives. <laughs> um, but I find this really beautiful, you know, just this sense that no matter what the child does, there'll always be that love, even if you don't get along with that child very well, or there are difficulties. There's still this sense of wanting to protect. And so this is the kind of love that we're aiming to develop towards all beings. And that includes ourself. Yeah? So we always have to remember ourself is included in that. So the way that this love manifests is in a, a sense of warmth, friendship, protection, perhaps caring for someone when they're sick, maybe just giving somebody a, a, an ear, you know, listening deeply to somebody, offering your time and attention, and sometimes offering advice. But loving kindness doesn't aim to fix anybody or solve any problems. Yeah. So although you want the person to be happy, it's not a demand. There's no expectation or pressure. You know, it doesn't depend on any kind of reciprocity either. You know, love in the worldly sense, especially if it's romantic love, or, yeah, romantic love in particular, because we have to choose one person, right? So naturally we're going to choose a person who we get along with, share interests with, you know, have some kind of personal um, resonance with, um, <coughs> which is all perfectly fine. But real unconditional loving kindness doesn't depend on any of that yeah? and nor does it expect the other person to make us happy so one of my favourite um, nuns, Tenzin Palmo she's a very um, strong and incredible um, English nun she's in her 70s now but she's famous for spending 12 years in a Himalayan cave 
above 3,000 meters altitude. And a uh, very powerful meditation. And um, she talks about love, and she says the difference between attachment and love is that attachment says, I love you, therefore I want you to make me happy. Whereas real love says, I love you, therefore I want you to be happy. Yeah? So there's a difference there. But at the same time, it's not a demand. Yeah, you're allowed not to be happy and still be accepted. And one of the lovely things that I always feel in the presence of my teacher is just his capacity to continue to give me that loving presence even when I'm going through a really difficult time, even when I feel that maybe I'm disappointing him in some way, <coughs> you know, or I'm seeing the faults in the system rather than feeling gratitude for the opportunities that I've been given. <coughs> And a couple of times I've, um, I mean, many times actually, I would speak to him and, you know, be quite upset. And uh, I think one of the things that fuels that sense of distress is feeling concerned about myself because, oh dear, I'm, I'm not doing well, you know. Oh. And then there's this worry that comes along with it that just makes you feel even worse. And what I noticed in his presence is that he would just sit there quietly and unworried, just calm, unworried as though it's absolutely normal for me to be crying and to feel upset. And he wouldn't give much advice, but afterwards I'd go away and think, gosh, that's really unusual. I don't think I can remember being met that way. You know, Most of the time that I show up in a worried state of mind, that triggers worry in others, and they start to sort of get concerned and maybe start also worrying about me. But he gave me this sense that it's perfectly okay and I still see your qualities, I still see your strength. I see something bigger than that, something beyond that. And that gives such enormous confidence, you know, that you can be held no matter what. And that all these emotions that come up are just part and parcel of being a human being. So I remember somebody went to him on a retreat once and said, well, I'm really fed up of hearing, you know, may I be happy, may I be happy all the time, because I'm not happy. In fact, I feel quite fed up today. You know, what about, is it okay to be fed up too? And he said, okay, hang on a minute, and went into his office. And he quickly typed up, he's very ingenious, quickly typed up uh, what he terms a grumpy license. (laughs) And it says on it something like, uh, this allows the person, name of the person, to be grumpy for any reason or no reason whatsoever, for as long as they wish, <laughs> and, uh, and, and signed, you know, by Ajahn Brahm. So he gave this grumpy license to that person, and who's now known as Miss Grumpy in Perth. <laughs> and, uh, <laughs> and of course, as soon as she saw that, she laughed, you know, and she wasn't feeling very grumpy anymore. So this is a kind of gift that we can give to each other, and for that reason, Metta's considered to be you know, unconditional, yeah? It, it remains loving in the face of suffering, in the face of happiness. But our wish for well-being, for, you know, happiness for that person remains consistent, yeah? And another quality of metta is that it's impartial. So it doesn't only go to those who please us, those who behave the way we wish them to, or who, you know, contribute something in our life, but it extends even to people who we may consider enemies or or, yeah, people who don't have our best interest at heart, yeah. And uh, there's a lovely poem that uh, I heard about when my teacher was kicked out of the uh, organisation for ordaining nuns, giving the full ordination. And uh, it's really beautiful, and to me it's a good uh, example of metta. So it goes something like, They drew a circle to, kick, to shut me out. Rebel, heretic a thing to flout. But love and I had the wit to win. We drew a circle that took them in. (laughs) So it's a little bit cheeky. (laughs) But this is uh, the thing about metta. We're widening this circle of what is acceptable, of, you know, where our love can extend to. So it's always about expansion, about a sense of boundlessness and, and increasing the heart's capacity to hold both happiness and pain. Yeah? So these states of metta are called immeasurable states, apamana, so we can't measure them. They're not confined to a particular size or shape. Yeah? And they're a great leveller. <coughs> I really like this word, leveller. So you know, no matter what background, culture, 
gender, sexual orientation we are, it goes to everybody equally and starts to break down those walls that divide us, you know, this sense of us and them. And it brings us out of discriminatory ways of thinking because we are all connected in our common humanity. You know, we all want happiness and we all do our best in our own ways to try to bring forth happiness in the world, you know. Nobody really even votes in ways that they actually genuinely think will harm the economy or harm, you know, each other. They actually vote in ways that they think are for the good, for example, you know, just because politics is such a, a hot topic at the moment. You know, it's really helpful to just see that most of us are coming from a good place. It may be misguided sometimes. We, we may think other people are misguided, of course. And we always think we're right. Otherwise, we wouldn't do what we do. <laughs> but, uh, yeah, we, we're all human beings who are trying our best. And Meta allows us to make mistakes. You know, it allows us to grow in our own time. We don't have to be perfect. So it takes away those demands and expectations and pressures that we put on ourselves and other people. <coughs> yeah. So I wanted to talk a little bit about the benefits of metta from the perspective of the Buddhist texts and also some benefits that I've seen in my own life. And um, it's interesting that the first benefits the Buddha talks about are all about sleep. <laughs> So I have to confess straight away that I didn't sleep so well with the fireworks going off at midnight for quite some time. And maybe a lot of you heard those fireworks. And I don't know if you peeked out of the window. I tried not to so that <laughs> I could get back to sleep. But one of the benefits of loving kindness is that it does help us sleep deeply and easily. Yeah? And I think this is because we have a deep sense that our lives are aligned to something beautiful. You know? and, and if you don't have ill will in the mind and you don't have sort of the regret and the remorse of bad conduct, you know, or, or speech that's harmed other people, then your mind is at some point settled. It settles much more easily. It's free from remorse and regret and the kind of things that can disturb our sleep. So we sleep very easily, and he said we fall asleep also quickly, and we wake up happy. And one of the things I really like to do is um, use metta before I go to bed, so just you know, say a few phrases of loving-kindness towards myself and maybe spread some loving-kindness towards others. Even if it's not very deep, you know, just having those thoughts and intentions in your mind as you go to sleep really helps you to have a nice sleep and to sort of set the tone for the night. And equally, you know, waking up in the morning just to start with a few minutes of metta, even just greeting yourself and saying, oh, good morning, me, here I am again, you know, I hope you're... You're well? Have you slept well? It sounds a bit silly, <laughs> but it's actually really nice because you're just taking that time to actually meet yourself and settle into your body and say, hello, here I am. You know, I've got this day ahead of me and I've got this opportunity, like the Dalai Lama says. You know, I have a precious human birth and I've got an opportunity to do good in the world. You know, may I meet the people that I meet in a kind way. So we're programming our mind, we're setting up a certain intention right at the beginning. And of course we're more likely for that intention to come out during the day. And even if we're going off track, you know, something may arise in the mind to remind you, hey, you know, this is not quite in line with your intention. So we have to program our mind. This is the good news about the fact that the mind is a conditioned phenomena. Yeah. It's not fixed. Yes, it's been programmed certain ways, but we can reprogram and that can continue you know it, it's a gentle reprogramming but if you're persistent with that the buddha said that becomes the inclination of your mind and more than just an inclination it becomes your whole character it becomes really hard to act intentionally in the harm of anyone you know including yourself but it's sometimes harder with ourselves yeah. so it's really important to you know spread that matter towards oneself as well as other beings so the first three are about sleep, and then the next three are about um, our relationship with others. And the Buddha says that, you know, um, human beings, are we're dear to human beings, to other human beings, we become dear. So we have many friends, which everybody would like, right? And this is because our behavior becomes harmless, yeah? We start to become people that others feel at ease around and a sense of safety around. Yeah? So by observing you know, virtue, by practicing virtue and kindness in life, we give people the gift of trust. P 
people can trust that we have good intentions. One of the nice things about being a nun, actually, in the Buddhist tradition, is that so far, <laughs> Buddhists have had quite a good um, reputation in the world. We haven't caused too many you know, conflicts. And that, of course, is changing. But then you have to ask, are those people really Buddhist or just people who you know, haven't really understood the Dhamma yet? But um, because of that, I tend to notice that people approach me with a sense of trust, which is really lovely, and I feel really grateful to the people who've practiced before me, you know, that we still do have this reputation of being generally kind and trustworthy. And uh, there's a responsibility that goes along with that, and so that's really a protection for me as well, you know, that by showing up this way, I have sort of something to live up to. I mean, not really high expectations, and I'm very, you know, open and human and have my failings, and I'm happy to, you know, be open about that. But, you know, at, at the same time, I think people on this path are trying their very best, you know, and, and, and we do give people a gift by our own practice, you know, the gift of harmlessness. Yeah, and taking some responsibility, even when we do make mistakes, you know, we can say, okay, well, yes, I had sort of a difficult mind state to deal with, or I wasn't feeling my best, you know, I was tired. So we can take some responsibility and try and, you know, see that we um, do something about that so we can bring forth the best of ourselves next time, yeah, instead of blaming everybody else outside, blaming the situation. So, and also he says that, you know, devas... Um, protectors so these are the heavenly beings and whether you believe in devas or not you can just think of it as good forces you know sometimes you notice that when you're on a roll with a, a good train of thought or you just feel that your life is unfolding in a good way things seem to come together to support that to continue yeah i mean i wouldn't be able to do my project without the support of many many people and because it's coming from a good place it's coming for me mostly out of gratitude to my teacher and wanting to serve you know, and, and contribute something back. And because of that, people are interested and seem to come on board to help. So it's really beautiful that one intention can kind of generate many, many intentions that <coughs> come along to support that. Yeah. And also, of course, you've probably noticed that animals sometimes sense as well if you're a kind person, if you're a harmless person. and They tend to come and curl up near you or sit on your lap, you know, and feel very safe. Yeah, there's a really nice story. I'm going off at a tangent again, but it's a really amazing story, I think, um, in Perth, where there was a, a stray cat that came to stay in the monastery, and they called it Kit Kat, <laughs> which is very nice. And, uh, and this cat was looked after by the monks for a certain amount of time, but then they realised they couldn't really look after it because it was doing things like catching rats and mice and the things that you know cats do, maybe some of the native birds as well. And they felt that it wasn't really appropriate to have a cat in a monastery. Um, and so they found some people in the city who wanted to look after this cat. And, uh, and the cat was put in the back of the car inside some kind of sack. I mean, maybe it sounds a bit cruel, but they, wanted, they didn't want the cat to know that it was being taken away, I guess. And so the cat was covered so it couldn't see where it was going. And they drove it into the city to some place that they'd never even that the cat had never been to before. And the cat stayed there for maybe a few days. And then my teacher Ajahn Brown was down in the city giving a teaching one one weekend. And he got a phone call. The the monastery got a phone call saying the cat's gone missing. We're really sorry, but the cat's run away. And so, of course, the owners thought maybe it's found its way back to the monastery somehow, even though it's like, I don't know, about 40 miles away. Maybe it's gone back to the monastery. Maybe it has a sense of smell or some kind of sense of where the monastery is. But then uh, Ajahn Brahm got the message and he phoned them back and he said, oh, don't worry, your cat's with me. <laughs> and he was in the city, <laughs> the other side of the city, across several big highways and in a place that the cat had never been to before you know, and <laughs> had no sense of, but it had found its way there somehow. I mean, it's just amazing, isn't it, how animals can be so tuned up to the people who care for them. And so they took it back to the monastery and kept the cat, and it has a little <laughs> burial area there in the monastery. So, just amazing. <laughs> and then the other um, benefits that the Buddha talks about are that the face of a person will become radiant. 
So this is a kind of, uh, it's, it's a really nice sort of different way to look at beauty, I think, because in the West, well, all over the world, we're so concerned with outward appearance, you know. But you can have the most beautiful face and features, but if you're full of, you know, anger and, and cruelty, you, you don't come across as a beautiful person, you know. It's not an attractive way to be. So beauty is something much deeper. And somebody with metta, you know, has this inner beauty and inner shine, and so the face becomes very radiant. Maybe we also frown a bit less, you know. Um, and then another benefit, which is really important for us, is that one with metta easily gets into deep states of meditation. So the Buddha calls this samadhi. Yeah? So the mind easily becomes settled, becomes still, becomes quieted, if one has a lot of loving kindness. Mm-hmm. Yeah? And of course, one reason for that is that Loving kindness is the antidote to ill will, which is the main hindrance, I would say, to meditation. You know, the other hindrances are all a sort of product of that ill will. Yeah, I mean, what is wanting but having thwarted? You know, it's having some wanting is wanting usually to get rid of something or wanting something other than what is here. Yeah, so it's just the other side of ill will and aversion. And when you don't get what you want, of course, you tend to feel quite upset about that. So ill will arises. So these are kind of two sides of the same coin. And then the drowsiness is often an escape from a situation we don't really like, you know, a mind state we don't really like. Sometimes it's just that we're sleepy. But often when you meditate, you're not sleepy. You just don't really want to be where you are. You want to be somewhere else, deeper in your practice or onto something interesting, you know. And so the mind kind of just slips off and goes into sloth and torpor. And restlessness, too, is just jumping away into something better, into fantasies of the future or memories of the past, you know, sort of romanticising things in the past that were never actually that good, but they seem good compared to what you have to deal with now. So we just skipping around from past to future, and that's a kind of restlessness. And then the other one is doubt, which is also a confused state. It's not a pleasant state, and not a state where it's possible to really have a lot of clarity. Yeah, so that's also a kind of um, negative state of mind, an unpleasant state of mind. So metta is the antidote to all of that, but also it has this beautiful quality of happiness and joy that goes along with it. And this is one of the benefits, you know, of, of making metta. One of your main practices, I think it's, you know, it can be used as an attitude like we have been doing so far with the compassion and the letting go, making peace, developing contentment. So we can have this sense of friendliness to whatever arises in our body and mind, yeah, in our heart, our emotional world. But also we can use metta as a cultivation in and of itself. So rather than maybe the breath, you can actually use the object of metta. So you, you choose an object, so a person usually, who perhaps you have natural feelings of warmth and goodwill towards. And the metta phrases help to direct the mind towards the experience of metta. So we generate good wishes towards that person. (coughs) And by repeating this again and again and again, the mind starts to incline towards the actual emotional quality of metta, of loving kindness. So it's almost as though the phrases are like the kindling of a fire. So you put on sticks and dry leaves on the fire to get it going. And these are like the phrases. And we start with somebody who's very easy to generate loving kindness towards. Mm -hmm. So somebody that we don't have difficulties with or too many complications in our relationship. You can think of it as somebody who brings a smile to your face when you think about them. They just give you a little bit of joy in your heart. And you have a natural feeling of wanting wanting their happiness, wanting to help them, wanting to protect them. Yeah. And so we can imagine this person in our mind's eye and generate these uh, wishes of loving kindness. And slowly, slowly this fire of metta starts to take off and the quality of metta starts to manifest in our body and mind. And then the phrases can gently, gently calm down. Maybe they become slower or less frequent as we start to listen to the gap between the words and to where the metta is pointing us to an actual felt experience of loving kindness. And this has a very, very pleasant quality and helps the mind to settle. And we start off in a discursive way, you know, by generating right thought, yeah, the right intentions of metta. 
but bit by bit we can you know start to quieten that down just as the buddha said in the suttas you know i mentioned a sutta recently called the dweda vitaka sutta about the three kinds of right thought or right intention and you start off by thinking these things and the buddha says even if you think that for a day and night there's no harm at all in that because it's such a pure thought pure intention but eventually even that seems like a disturbance to the stillness that starts to develop in the mind And so the phrases start to fall away or maybe become shorter to the point where it can be just one word. So you might start with, may I be happy or may you be happy. And after a while it becomes just happy. Or may I be peaceful. It can just become peace or peaceful. Yeah. So as the mind becomes quieter, we need less and less of the thinking and we tune more and more into the words. And in the suttas, actually, these um, kind of instructions come from the commentaries the, um, where you would go through various categories of being. So you'd start with the loved person or the benefactor and then move on to somebody who is someone you don't have particularly strong feelings about. It's called the neutral person in the Visuddhimagga, some of the commentarial texts. And once the metta, once you're able to generate loving kindness towards them, sort of almost as strongly as you can to the loved person, you can move on to the difficult person or a person that you have difficulties in your relationship with. And this is not usually recommended to be the most difficult person in your life because that's just a little bit too much to take on. And that's almost like putting huge logs on the fire when the fire's still only just warming up. You know, you just snuff the whole thing out. (laughs) And there was a very nice um, story that one of my teachers uh, (laughs) told me on a retreat He's the one that I'm actually going to meditate with in America now. He's a French-Canadian monk. And uh, we were in a monastery in Australia in the winter, and it was very cold. People always think Australia is hot, but it's also very cold in the winter, especially in little cooties that don't have any insulation. So we were in these little wood huts without uh, insulation. And he asked me how to light the fire, because there were these sort of cylindrical stoves in the, in the cottage, And they were very narrow, and there wasn't much airflow, actually. So it was quite difficult to light. So I said, oh, well, just start with, you know, some um, dry branches and twigs. And then, you know, put on a few smaller branches and then maybe some larger ones. And eventually, when it's going, just put on the big ones. And the next day he came and said, oh, I did all of that, but it didn't work. He said it just became, you know, completely smoked out in my cottage. And my cottage was full of smoke. I had to leave the cottage. And I said, really, what did you do? He said, well, I did what you said, and I put the kindling and put this and put that. And, but it didn't work. And I said, but you were supposed to put them on one by one. He said, oh, I put them all on at the same time. <laughs> so that's why it didn't work. Because <laughs> there wasn't enough space and airflow, you know, and chance for that meta to get going, for that fire to get going. So if you think of meta like a kindling of fire, you have to give it space, yeah? So you say the phrases very gently, but you listen deeply to the gap between the words. And you really give it time and patience and a lot of space to start arising naturally. And then you can move to somebody who you maybe don't like very much, but not the enemy. Yeah? Not, the, not somebody who's really hurt you or who, by remembering, would bring up a sort of trauma response. We don't want that kind of uh, response to be coming up at this stage. In my own practice, there was somebody who I mentioned yesterday who, um, yeah, who did, uh, our relationship was not very healthy, let's say, and I was quite traumatized from that. And in the beginning, I remember someone saying, well, you'll have to say meta to her. But actually, I couldn't, because every time I'd think about this, I'd just get triggered, you know, and I realized that what I needed was a complete break of thinking about that person just to regather myself and to actually address the hurt and the trauma that was in me you know it was me that needed my own meta much more than having to think about sending it to somebody who was quite difficult to send it to at that time so um it was probably a year or two years after basically she attacked me physically so it was after that that I was at Guy House practicing a lot of meta and I was practicing it towards my best friend, who I've always had a very wholesome relationship with and who's been there throughout my life and is a very good example of unconditional love for me. You know, she knows me as like a little four-year-old and a, a kind of rebellious teenager and just so many different things. So she knows me very well. And uh, so I was sending Meta to her, 
and the meta was really starting to build and I was feeling really resourced and really happy and this was going on for a week or so. And then just the thought of this other friend who'd hurt me came up in my mind. And it was as al- almost as though she just joined this flow of metta, this like, almost like an ocean of metta. And she just kind of joined in with it. And the metta just continued, just very naturally. And uh, ever since then, thoughts of her or even memories of what happened don't impact me in the same way at all. So this is an example of that um, sutta I mentioned a couple of days ago, the simile of the salt crystal, yeah, where you put a salt crystal in a glass of water and it tastes very salty. So this is how it would have been if I'd have brought up those, that person where my mind was still quite you know, fragile yeah, and, and not resourced. But then when my mind was big and expansive and you know, resourced with metta and, and there was a lot of happiness and joy and feeling of well-being and safety then when I thought of that person it hardly had any impact yeah so the effect was very different and this is what it means by you know the effects of the past they have different results depending on the kind of mind they meet in the present so we have some ability to you know change our mind in this present moment and thereby change the way that actions or situations from the past will manifest for us yeah, so we can always do something about our mind in the present. So metta is very healing also, and yet we're not practicing in order to heal. Yeah. I had another um, situation last year where um, just before I was about to go for my annual lanes retreat in Australia, I was diagnosed with a melanoma, which was quite a shock, actually, because I'd had this mole that was always a really weird shape, like, but I'd kind of got quite fond of it. It was like my unusual little... Oh, I was quite at peace with that. But, um, yeah, my mum had commented a couple of months previously that it looked a little bit bigger than usual than it had done in the past. And then a close friend came over and she said, hmm, it does look a bit bigger. I don't remember anything like that on your arm. And while she was with me, it suddenly started to change really, really quickly. Like, it was quite alarming, actually. It became red and then it became crusted and black bits and I was sure that this was not a good thing. (laughs) So... Luckily, I was in a position to go straight to a specialist and have, um, what did they call it, a mole check. And immediately they got back to me and said it's a melanoma. Um, And I had to make an appointment to go in and have it removed. And at that time, the earliest one they could get was 10 days later. And I was going to Australia in uh, two weeks or two and a half weeks. So I was like, oh, my goodness, I've got to sit and watch this thing for the next week, changing like lightning speed. It was literally changing every couple of hours. (coughs) And uh, it was a really interesting time because I could do nothing, right, except wait. And I had a couple of days on my own. And it was really interesting to notice. I mean, often people say when you have, you know, something that could be life-threatening or when you do have a life-threatening disease, you're sort of living at a heightened level of awareness. And it was very much the case for me. I felt like all my senses were sort of heightened and even the way I looked at my life was very different. I suddenly realised how much I value my life. And until then, I don't know. I'm not the biggest life-affirming person in the world. I mean, I would like an end to samsara. That's my... That's why I'm a nun, right? (laughs) Because I understand the suffering. Yes, there's a way out. And that means we can live a happier life, but still... I would like a complete end to suffering. But at this, so I I sort of had this delusion somehow that maybe I'd be ready to die at any time and I'm not really particularly attached to my life and, you know, it's a lot of hard work anyway kind of thing. (laughs) 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 But suddenly, you know, when this happened, I suddenly realised that I was so privileged to be living the life I do, which is of benefit to myself and has the potential to benefit so many other people. And I suddenly felt like a sort of love for my life and a love for the project, which I hadn't realised was there. I mean, I know I believe in the project. I know that it's an expression of gratitude, but I hadn't necessarily felt connected to it with love, like real love, as though I was giving birth to a child almost. You know? and, and this was really amazing to me. And I, I would go between being, feeling filled with love and gratitude and a sense of just having lived my life to the best of my ability and in a way that I have no regrets over which was very beautiful to realize 
So I'd sort of go between that and then this really visceral fear that would come up, like literally just trembling through my body. So I'd be doing my usual thing, you know, working, organising events and things like that. And then I'd stand up and I'd just go, ooh, all the way through, you know, this fear coursing through my body. But it was really lovely because I felt it could be held in this bigger sense of love and gratitude for my life. And also I felt more love to others, but also much more love from others, so that the people who came to the monastery at that time, I really saw their kindness and their goodwill and felt so grateful for them being there. Because there's nothing as scary as just being alone when you don't know what's going to happen. Yeah, But eventually, anyway, it was good news because my appointment was put forward. There was a cancellation. I had it removed and I still had a week to wait for the result but it hadn't spread so that was such a relief and again you know you never feel so healthy and so happy as when you've just been told that you're free from disease (laughs) for now but I've got a really nice scar to remind me of that experience so that was really lovely and then after I got to Perth it was about to heal but I got an infection in my arm (laughs) So I had to go out and get antibiotics and uh, I went to my teacher quite upset about it, feeling quite sorry for myself actually. And he just said, practice metta. So I practiced metta and you know when you practice, when there's a real urgency to the practice, you don't mess around in the same way. You know, it's not like, oh, may I be happy? Oh yeah, what am I having for dinner? <laughs> oh yeah, may I be happy? <laughs> I really kind of listened, you know. I really tried to choose the phrases that resonated deeply with me and that were really sort of expressions of goodwill towards myself. And I chose them carefully and I listened. And I was practicing this this way and the meta was starting to... You know, I was very patient. I wasn't looking for any result. But three and a half hours later, I came out of my meditation. I was like, oh my goodness. It's like half past six, <laughs> time for tea, you know. And sometimes it's like that. When we really have a need to practice, we, we do. And the metta starts to calm. I mean, it's very tricky, again, because you're not doing the metta in order to get a result and in order to heal. But it was interesting that the next day the infection started to subside quite significantly and something there changed. I was on antibiotics, so it could be that they kicked in. But I do like to think that the metta helped. You know? And so metta has great healing powers. And it is interesting that in that kind of situation, it was metta that I chose to go to, over and above, you know, vipassana meditation, open awareness, bare awareness, breath meditation. It was the metta that seemed to be the most important thing. And I do think, you know, that in this path, really, is there anything more important than opening our heart? I mean, even wisdom, what's the purpose of wisdom if not to open our heart to others? and to dissolve those barriers between ourselves and others. Between others. You know, what's the point of wisdom if it's just knowledge and our behavior doesn't change or our sense of love and connection doesn't change, you know, doesn't grow. So I think metta loving kindness is not just some sort of flowery superfluous aspect of practice, it's actually the heart of it literally. And we'd all do well to develop loving kindness in our lives and in our hearts. So I'd like to offer some um, practices today on loving kindness, but at the same time, um, really encourage you to find your way with it. Because for some people, the phrases might just seem clunky or like too much work. You know, you might not really feel like repeating things to yourself again and again. And waiting for the meta to arise, you know, like, what, what's all this about? Sometimes we can just instead try to infuse our awareness with a sense of warmth and love and care yeah, towards whatever arises. So that's what I call meta as an attitude. Yeah? But then there's also meta as a cultivation, meta as a samadhi cultivation, a samadhi practice to calm the mind. And this does involve that sort of repetition. So we say the phrases sort of, again and again and again and they become the anchor for our mindfulness so they direct our mind in a certain way and we have to give it time we have to give it patience and say these words as though planting seeds very very delicate gentle precious seeds yeah you don't plant the seeds in the soil and then watch for the plant to grow and kind of start digging in there like is the seed sprouting or not you know and then when the seed's sprouting you think come on come on hurry up and pull the leaves, 
you know, we're not doing that. We're just planting the seeds with love, and that's it. And just leave the seed there to do its work. So even just having these intentions starts to purify the mind. Because as the Buddha said, you know, you can't have a thought of loving kindness and an unpleasant or a, a, a cruel or hostile thought simultaneously. It's impossible. They don't coexist. Yeah? So one of the methods he talked about was substitution. Yeah? Substituting an unwholesome thought for a wholesome thought. So when we see those unwholesome thoughts, we can replace them with thoughts of metta. And this is really great. I mean, not to do it with force, and sometimes the mind's just not in a position to practice metta. The Buddha says the, ha- the mind has to be, what does he, how does he put it? You have to be at the point where the hindrances don't invade and obsess the mind. Yeah? So if the mind is really, really full of agitation, it's probably not the time to develop loving kindness. It might be more helpful just to give that space. Yeah, just to allow that to sort of almost burn itself out. Yeah, maybe give yourself some compassion. Give that emotional disturbance some compassion and, and just continue with open awareness or mindful practice or body awareness. Yeah? So it's good to start every meditation that way. And then if you see that the mind is ready and receptive, we can start to just plant those seeds of metta and see where it takes us. Yeah? So I'd like to offer that um, practice this morning with a little bit of guidance. And again, feel free to take anything that's helpful and leave anything aside that's not. And um, before we start, maybe just to have a a few moments of reflection, you can have a five-minute break. And to choose a person or a... It doesn't even have to be a person, actually. It can sometimes be that people don't have anyone in their life that they feel a particularly um, good relationship with or that generates natural feelings of warmth and friendship. Sometimes it might be like even a little plant, yeah, or even an animal like a poppy or a cat or a baby, yeah. Somebody that you have just natural feelings of warmth towards and that there's not too much of a history with that you start getting (coughs) into stories about what happened with that person last time you met and I shouldn't have said this and they did that, which wasn't really... Yeah, so somebody who's quite easy to develop loving kindness. It can even be a tree, something like that. So just have a think about what that object might be, who that might be, or what that might be. And um, and also some phrases. So I can tell you, I can share my usual phrases because uh, I try to choose words that are positive um, rather than words such as may you be free from suffering. Just because I watched a film once about water and about the um, effect that words have on the particles in water, which was really fascinating. I think it's called The Miracle of Water, something like that, if you want to watch it. And um, there was a Japanese researcher who found that every word creates a different, um, what do you call them, crystal in water. And when you say sort of angry or nasty words to water, it actually has these really distorted crystals. Whereas when you say words like love and gratitude, it has beautiful crystal, and the molecular formation of that water changes, which is so interesting, and this is all done very scientifically. So I like to choose positive words that basically denote safety, health, happiness, etc. So I usually say, may I be happy, may I be free, may I be healed, may I be at peace. And I like that because they sort of rhyme as well, and they're quite short. But I came up with those because I I really wanted to resonate with what I wish for myself at a very deep level. So everybody's words will be different, and they might change from time to time. But for me, I've been using those so long that when I start to say them, they're almost like so associated with the feelings of metta that it's quite a quick route in to developing metta. So just have a think about that too, about what you really wish for this person or this being or this plant in your life. (laughs) And uh, we'll meet in five minutes and do some loving-kindness meditation. Great.